On this episode of Urban U, a student who dropped out of school nearly six decades ago returns to CUNY and earns two degrees. Tastes Like War, the personal account of a Korean American's exploration of food and family history. A brand new DNA learning lab at City Tech in Brooklyn. And the most famous scientist of all time in his first lecture in the U.S. right here at CUNY. That and much more. Welcome to Urban U. I was the first in my family to even consider college. Ciro Scala was born in the United States, the first generation of his family to be born here. But when he was younger, he went to City College at night, working during the day. But Ciro didn't finish his degree and instead went into a long and successful career in textiles. But in the back of his mind, education still called to him. Somehow I got to get back to school. Someone had to get, find a way to get there. Now, the job was really a big job. We eventually opened our own business. So I was really into that business big. We traveled around the world in that Texas. We had our own company and we did all that stuff. But it was never really, it almost was a, it came too easy to me. This career was over. And what was the rest of my life going to be? I wasn't going to, and then the teaching and the history was really, a focal point for me. I said, this is perfect. I can go ahead and try to get back to school. I can get there, get my degree, and then hopefully, luckily, I could begin to teach. And so in 2016, he enrolled once again at City College. But while earning his two degrees, one in history and another in political science, something occurred to him as he talked to other younger students. As I met them, I started to think about my journey and their journey and they were very similar in a lot, of aspects, a lot of ways. So we had a lot to talk about. And we talked about uh, studying in one room with nieces and nephews and uncles and aunts coming to visit. And we had, uh, how, how do you get an apartment? We have to, I, I, well, have to work. All those little things that we take for granted sometimes, they, these were big pressure packed for them. And out of this came the first generation workshop housed at the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership, offering students guidance and support. We had great advisors speak. We had people who worked on internships, scholarships. Uh, we also had financial information for them to tell them how, to, how do you get a credit card. And we had people who were graduates who spoke to them about their experience. What I want to do is make sure we have something set at CUNY where we can have a, a, a whole set to absorb and welcome these students, which we will continue to have for generations, and maybe that's that location at, at Colin Powell School could be maybe the, the, the clearinghouse, the special spot where all that can happen. Ciro now teaches history and English at a private school in Brooklyn Heights. Do you consider yourself a lifelong learner? I would say I'm a lifelong uh, sponge. I don't, every, anything uh, I touch, I want to get a bit of it. Having earned his two degrees from City College in 2020, Ciro continues to learn and inspires a new generation of students. For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson. If I could describe my style of dancing in three words, it would definitely be fierce, sexy, and confident. I'm Sima Sadikov, I'm 20 years old, and I'm a four-time U.S. national champion in the style of ballroom Latin dancing. My love for dance started at the age of five. My mom actually put me into a dance class because she wanted me to have a nice posture. So she took me to a dance studio nearby our house, and it kind of just took off from there. Ballroom Latin has a mix of different styles in it, like ballet, contemporary, and obviously the roots from Latin dancing. The best way that I could explain it to people is when I ask them, oh, you know Dancing with the Stars? And then I tell them, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> when I was younger, I never even thought of being a national champion. I just thought, oh, I'm gonna dance because I love it. And that's it. And when I got that first title, the only thing I wanted to do was just hold on to it. 
Being a hunter, I feel like I get the best of both worlds. I get to pursue my dreams of becoming a journalist, but I also get to continue dancing at school. It's very important to be warmed up in any style of dance, and I have a few exercises that I do. There's one where I would hold onto the wall and kind of just move one side of my body to the other. Uh, this is called isolation. Wearing the proper apparel to dance is also extremely important. Personally, I feel that dressing in the proper clothing, it makes me feel more confident. I have this performance dress. I call it rainbow dress because it's stoned with the colors of the rainbow. It's super unique, super beautiful. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into that dress. My dance partner, Matthew Kafitz and I, we didn't think that we would look good together, but when we had our tryout, we were like, wow, we look amazing together. And, you know, everything that I've accomplished, I've accomplished with him. So he's really my best friend. My coach has, without a doubt, shaped me to be the dancer that I am today. When I was younger, I would be judged by people who would gossip and say, oh, she's a little too big for ballroom dancing. She's not going to be a champion. And it left me a little bit insecure. And so that's why when I met my coach, he just, you know, he saw potential in me. And that's all he saw. It really changed my way of thinking of things. I like to live in the moment. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. I don't know what's gonna happen in a month or in a year. All I know is that dance is always gonna be a part of my life and nobody can take that away from me. Queen's Memory was always a collaboration between Queen's Public Library and Queen's College. And we've just continued that over the years and worked with lots of amazing, really talented faculty and students from Queen's College and a lot of other CUNY schools. And what we're able to do with the Queen's Memory Project is to take a snapshot of what's happening right now and to try to really actively go out and get that history as it's happening so that people in 100 years from now can look back and really understand what Queen's looked like in 2021. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City, these Black, Queens-based first responders responded to their community in a time of critical need. A lot of the stories that I've heard in our oral history interviews give me a sense of Queens that is very different from what I would have. And when I visit neighborhoods, I think about the stories that I've heard from people. Places that stand out or are special because of someone's lived experience. My name is Julio Salas. I'm originally from Corona, Queens, born and raised. And I've been at the same house since I was about two years old, right by Lemon Ice King. My obsession with self-improvement began here at the handball courts. From 12 to 17, every summer, 12 to 8 p.m., Monday through Sunday, every single day. Handball taught me how to be patient, taught me how to work hard, and so then I translated that work ethic to school. From 9 to 12th grade, I went to John Bowen High School, did two years here at QCC, and now I'm currently an undergrad at Cornell University. I sometimes walk on the campus, I go to class, I'm still just in awe, and I don't think I'll ever get over that. And I just can't believe I'm at the library of Cornell University studying for my class. So originally when I came to Queensboro, I was afraid to answer, afraid to maybe um, not looking smart. But Professor Bridget Tilly from the English department made me like to read, so she introduced me to a, a whole separate world almost. She sort of took the chance on me. Definitely one professor who again sort of took her chance with me was Dr. Schneider. She teaches biology. Um, she said, would you be interested in doing research? And I said, yeah. When I came to Queensboro, I wanted to be a primary care physician and then in this last, last year, I realized instead I want to do pediatrics to help tackle the social determinants of health and also because by helping kids, I'm also at the same time helping the parents. Now what drives me is really the people, all the people I want to serve, because that's like what I want to dedicate my life to, which is basically kids who were me.
our identities affect us a lot, especially when you're from maybe minority identities, low income. I think when you're low income, you're just not low income. You're most likely to see abuse, trauma, single parent household, which all affect you in many different ways. You don't believe in yourself, you have a low self-esteem, you maybe won't reach for something. I've never been treated by a Latino doctor and I personally haven't met one. And that definitely made me feel a little, a little, I guess, bad and thinking like, I can't, but now I don't think that. And so like, I want to change that for others. Here at Queensboro, started becoming my own person. And I think that definitely helped make me feel overall happier. And of course, you know, when you feel happier, you just perform everything better. So it benefited everything. It benefited school, it benefited my relationships, my family with friends. Uh, my outlook on life, my perspective, it began here. Queensboro nurtured it. Had it not been for Queensboro, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I always say, if this kid from Corona could do it, then any kid can. Food and war. The two have been intertwined for centuries, with food being rationed, withheld, or even destroyed as a means of attack during times of conflict. But for Grace Cho, food and the history of war in her native Korea have helped her to uncover parts of her family's past and gain new ground with her mother before her death. She details this in her new book, Tastes Like War. Tastes Like War is part food memoir and part sociological investi investigation, really centered around the search to understand my mother's schizophrenia. Cho was born in Busan, Korea. Her father was a U.S. merchant marine. Kunja, her mother, was a native of Korea. By the time she was a toddler, her family settled in a small, predominantly white town in Washington state, where Cho says racism was quite prevalent. Cho remembers her mother's beauty and charisma and how she did clever things to adapt, mostly through food, despite the hostility they faced. Once I entered kindergarten, she had this idea that she was going to host a dinner party for all of the school staff and the administrators. It was a small school system, so she was able to invite all of them into our home. As Cho approached adolescence, things took a drastic turn. When I was 15, I noticed that she started to develop some signs of what Western psychiatry would call schizophrenia, and it was this very seminal moment for me, which then sort of led me down this path of investigation. During graduate school, she began her research into her mother's past. What she found was a web of family trauma, largely stemming from the Korean War and its aftermath. About three million civilians were killed during that war. Another two million that were classified as missing or wounded. That war was incredibly devastating for the civilian population. Including Kunja, who lost a brother who seemingly disappeared, and her father who died of stomach cancer during the war. Later, her 26-year-old sister also died of stomach cancer. Cho wonders if the poor food supply for Koreans during the war led to their illness. The aftermath of the war brought on more trauma after her deceased sister's two young children disappeared. Later, Cho's mother met her father while working on a U.S. Army base, possibly as a sex worker. By the 19, early 1960s, the South Korean government established an official system of state-sanctioned prostitution for U.S. troops. They were shunned from society because of the shame and stigma around the work. My mom worked at, I'm not sure what type of establishment exactly, maybe a bar. Um, so she could have been a bar hostess, she could have been a sex worker. Based on my research, it's very likely that she had been a sex worker. But I did speak to my father about it, and, you know, he, he did not deny it. Based on the trauma that your mother experienced, do you believe that she became mentally ill because of that trauma, or do you think it was something else? I think that it is the primary reason for it. I don't think it's the only reason. Um, because there is a biological component, you know, I'm not going to deny that at all. But when I was growing up, that discourse that it is just a broken brain or it's just a bad gene that causes schizophrenia, um, I've always challenged that even before I had the capacity to do research to find 
um, another explanation. Kunja died in 2008. Cho says she treasures the time they shared before her death when they bonded over food. In the last few years of her life, I took on this role as her cook. But through the process of learning how to cook these Korean foods, and particularly foods that my grandmother cooked for her, it allowed something to heal in my relationship with her, but I think it also allowed something to heal in her in terms of those traumatic wounds that she had been carrying for so long, because it sort of brought her back to her youth and her childhood in Korea in a way that was very safe and nurturing. Abby Ashola for Urban U. Still up on Urban U, we switch gears to science with stories about a brand new DNA lab at City Tech and Einstein's first lecture in the U.S. back in the 20s, right here at our own City College of New York. Stay tuned. We want this place to be the place in New York City that someone comes to if they want to learn about genetics and DNA science. Take one old City Tech building in Brooklyn, raise $18 million for a makeover, and welcome to the DNA Learning Center NYC at the New York City College of Technology, a collaboration of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and CUNY. The program here is not just focused on the kids in uh, school but uh, they offer and will be offering programs in the weekends and on evenings so people can come here and really gain a better understanding of genetics related to their health and health issues and to their ancestry. And speaking of ancestry... Well, Barry, we're hoping to make this a destination museum, much like the American Museum of Natural History. Hey, who's the skinny guy over there? That's Otzi the Iceman. He's over 5,300 years old. Doesn't look it. He was discovered in the Otzel Alps, yeah. which is on the border between Italy and Switzerland. And we were able to extract DNA from him and ascertained what he ate, what he wore, and the type of lifestyle he had. He's a hunter. During the school year, kids come here for what we call lab field trips. And we've made a commitment to fund one half of those field trips during the academic year. I created the concept of the DNA Learning Center in 1988 in Cold Spring Harbor. And then we brought it here to New York City because we wanted to reach more kids. This facility cost about $18 million in renovations. Another $12 million for scholarships because we want to give scholarships to disadvantaged students and underrepresented minority students. Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is the number one rated biological research institution in the world. Established at Cold Spring Harbor on the north shore of Long Island in 1890. There's about 20 centers that we've been affiliated with in some way. There's one in Singapore, there's one in Australia, there's some in Europe, and several across the United States. Meet two motivated high school seniors who spend most of their free time at the Learning Center. We love doing this and being in the lab and working in the lab. These teenagers conducted a DNA experiment in Prospect Park. Our experiment is about researching fungi that's good for the environment and the trees. We realized that a lot of scientists and a lot of research is done on fungi that is harmful to the environment, so we wanted to change that, and even if it's just baseline work. So we had a reference of like fungi that was known to be in trees, whether it was good or bad, and then we took our, we extracted the DNA from the soil that we, from the samples we collected, and then we did it ourselves in the lab, and then we put it into the gel electrophoresis to sequence it ourselves. Electrophoresis, the movement of charged particles in a fluid or gel under the influence of an electric field. I'm a student here at City Tech. I have taken my pre-medical prerequisite coursework here. I'm in the process of reapplying to medical school, and currently I'm enrolled in molecular and cellular biology. I'm a hands-on learner and getting to practice lab techniques that I've read about in books for several years. It's really just been an invaluable experience. This is my last semester and I'm looking forward to applying for master's degree in bioinformatics. 
bioinformatics is both computer and biology, and it has to do with DNA and protein sequencing. So I look forward to coming here and do some research projects. Yes, DNA. It's not just for crime scenes anymore. I'm taken by some of the opportunities we provide the students to walk down to the food cart on the corner and buy something and bring it back up to the lab and in two hours figure out what it is that they're actually going to eat. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, an eye-opener. The DNA Learning Center at City Tech. For more information, go to dnalc.org. And do you know why the mushroom got invited to so many parties? Because he's a fun guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barry Mitchell, <laughs> Urban U. <laughs>the exhibit is organized into different sections to help tell the story of sharks of all sorts, starting with predator or prey, sharks with super senses, and sharks from around the world. We want to stress you know, the, the long evolutionary history, how we're still learning more with every fossil that's found. That's kind of the two messages. Wow, you've got this incredible diversity that's lasted forever, and humans have taken a very short time to basically wipe a lot of them out. Sharks runs until August 14th, 2022. So make your plans to plunge into the world of sharks. About a century ago, on April 2nd, 1921, the SS Rotterdam pulled into the battery in Lower Manhattan to thousands of cheering fans. To read about it now, the reporting makes the event sound like the hysteria that welcomed the Beatles' first visit. And this was indeed a first visit to the States just for a different kind of European star. This was the first trip to America for Albert Einstein. And his first academic lecture wasn't with a science symposium or at the White House, it was at City College. It cannot be overstated how much of a celebrity Einstein was at the time. In 1919, Einstein's theory of general relativity was confirmed by the scientific community, and our understanding of the universe changed. And it was reported on as such that for 200 years, Isaac Newton's laws of gravity explained so much of our world, and in a flash, Einstein changed the game. This vaulted Einstein into the international spotlight to celebrity status. The New York Times wrote of the frenzy as his ship pulled in. He looked like an artist, a musician, he was, but underneath his shaggy locks was a scientific mind whose deductions have staggered the ablest intellects of Europe. Einstein's first visit to America, though, was not planned just for discussing his work. He had actually come with the future first president of Israel, Chaim Weizmann, in the hopes to raise funds for a Hebrew university in Jerusalem, feeling that growing anti-Semitism in Europe after World War I was making it hard for young Jews to further their education. But on April 7th, Einstein made his first appearance in American academia, lecturing at City College, the first of five appearances that month discussing his theory of general relativity. Just how revolutionary was this theory at the time? Well, even his travel partner, Chaim Weizmann, actually a renowned scientist in his own right, joked that, Einstein explained his theory to me every day, and by the time we arrived, I was fully convinced that he really understands it. But however difficult the concepts, the campus certainly got into the fervor nonetheless, with articles in the school newspaper, including a satirical play script titled Relativity, and a giant assembly with 3,500 students and faculty. Einstein's trip would go on to see him visit places like Columbia University, Princeton, and Harvard, and receive honors like a National Guard marching band parade in Cleveland, and a meeting with President Warren G. Harding in Washington. The U.S. Senate even took up a debate on the theory of relativity. But for all the places along the way, City College was a first stop. 
But the visit would not be Einstein's last, of course. To leave these victims to their misery would be a heavy blow to all those who believe in human solidarity. With the rise of Hitler in his native Germany, he would emigrate to America permanently in 1933, 12 years after he first left City College, to a standing ovation, saying, it gives me the greatest pleasure on this, my first visit to America, to have this opportunity of meeting the student body of this great university. I appreciate very much your friendly reception and applause and extend to you all my heartiest good wishes. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. We leave you with Queensborough Community College and one of its recent student dance workshops. Until next time, thanks for watching these stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. Thank you.